to again welcome you to the final night of our 12th annual, according to the scriptures, Church of Christ Lectureship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In case you didn't understand Arthur, <laughs> my name is Michael Crosby, yeah. <laughs> the minister of the South Garland Church of Christ, where I've been blessed to be accepted and loved there for the last 10 years. All right. The theme of this lectureship, again, is on the wall. It says, Dangers Facing the Church. And the topic that was assigned to me is entitled, Danger of the Mega Church Movement. Mm -hmm. I had some difficulty with this, especially since I was coming from 2 Timothy chapter 3, well. where... Paul writes to young Timothy and says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boastful, mm -hmm. proud. <clears throat> and you know anybody like that? <laughs> Blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, yeah. unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded. Lovers of pleasure more yeah. than lovers of God. <laughs> Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From yeah. such, turn away. For of this sort are they that creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with <clears throat> sins. Mm -hmm. Led away with diverse lusts. Uh -huh. Ever learning. Did you hear what I said? Yes, Ever learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a problem because, not because I have no experience with the mega church, but because I have a great deal of experience All right. with mega churches. Mm -hmm. When I was in Georgia, mm -hmm. I served in North Atlanta for a congregation that had 1,100 members. Mm -hmm. When I moved to Oklahoma, I served a congregation that had 1,300 members. Mm -hmm. When I came to Dallas, I thought I didn't have to serve large congregations anymore. Well, then I was transferred from Dallas to San Angelo and served a congregation with 1,400 members. Mm -hmm. Came back to Dallas and eventually wound up with a congregation that had 1,100 members and when I left they had, oh, they had close to 2,000. Not because the church swelled is actually because we put forth evangelism efforts All right. mm -hmm. and baptized on average six to seven people a week. Our largest one was 14 people in one back, in, at one time in the baptistry. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know about mega churches. I spent 20 years in corporate America well. and spent 10 years serving congregations full time. And I can tell you, the politics that are played in corporate America have nothing compared to the politics in the mega church. Mm -hmm. At least in corporate America, you got a human resources department. You think in the body of Christ that you would have book, chapter, and verse to be the overguiding factor, but unfortunately, that is not the case. No. No. So sometimes we, we, we need to understand before we get into a topic, let's define the topic. Yeah. Okay. It says the danger of the mega church movement. So, what is a mega church, and what is the mega church movement? Mm -hmm. Well, do you mind if I, I give you what is written by man first before I give you what's written by God? All right. The Hartford Institute for Religion Research defines a mega church as any Protestant Christian church having two thousand or more people in an average weekend attendance. The concept originated in the 1800s in Europe and is widely seen across the United States in the early 21st century. In 2010, the Hartford Institute's database listed more than 1,300 such Protestant churches in the United States. According to that data, approximately 50 churches on that list had an average attendance exceeding 10,000 every week. With the highest recorded at 47,000 in average attendance. In 2007, five of the ten largest Protestant churches were found in South Korea. The largest mega church in the United States is called the Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, with more than 40,000 members every weekend. And the largest one in the world is called Yoido, Full Gospel Church, in South Korea, 
get this, with more than 830 members every weekend. 830,000, let me say it that way. 830,000 every weekend. In the United States, the movement has more than quadrupled in the past two decades. On one weekend in November 2015, around one in ten Protestant churchgoers in the United States, or about five million people, attended service in what man calls a mega church. This excludes millions of Catholics because they don't consider themselves Protestant. Amen. But we still protest anything that is not in the body of Christ. There are literally thousands of mega churches thriving, while for some reason in this country, smaller churches of Christ are struggling to survive. People often make decisions based on what they see. For example, the overcrowded restaurant must serve better food than the empty one. Or the movie that has the longer line must be more entertaining than the movie with few folks in that line. Or the church that has millions of likes of so on social media must be better than the ones that have just a few hundred. Mm -hmm. How can the Lord's church reach those lost souls who search for truth via the social media eye test? Or should we even bother? What are the dangers of the mega church movement? Well, mm -hmm. well allow me to come from 1 Timothy chapter 3. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul gives motives behind the megachurch movement, yeah. verses 1 through 5. He gives the formula for producing a megachurch in verses 6 and 7. He gives examples of those who participated in megachurches in verses 8 and 9. And the solution to the megachurch movement is found in verses 10 through 17. Mm -hmm. If you'll allow me, I'll try to hit all of this as quickly as I can because I understand mm -hmm. that they're going to hold me to 30 minutes. Yeah. Amen. Now, I, I wish that same type of tenacity was displayed last night. <laughs> Danger number one of the mega church. It is sinister in its origin. Verses one through five. Mm -hmm. Beloved, scripture teaches that teaches us that fascinations such as the megachurch movement, are born out of being dissatisfied with God's message well, and God's methodology. And this happens when both leaders and laity have, number one, a competitive attitude. Mm -hmm. A corrupt spirit says, my congregation is the best and it's going to be the biggest. Mm -hmm. This mindset violates such scriptures as 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, where the Bible says, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Whenever I try to take my congregation and compare it to your congregation, I need to understand something. The congregations don't belong to us. They belong to Jesus. And so it's foolish for me to try to make mine the biggest, the baddest, and the best, but I don't own anything. Yeah. The Bible also teaches us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, it says, honor all men, yes. love the brotherhood, fear God, and here's the one where I need a lot of prayer for, honor the king. All right. Some of y'all will catch that on the way yeah. home. <laughs> we must want the best for the entire brotherhood. Not just our congregation because we fear the Lord. Yeah. Not only does a competitive attitude drive the mega church movement, yeah. but a conceited attitude drives the movement. It says a selfish spirit says this within itself. I want my church to be bigger, livelier, and less traditional like the one that we found on 175. Mm. It's amazing when we have our meetings, there's, a, there's room enough for a whole other congregation to come and join us. Yeah. But when they have their meetings and they have to pay for parking where they are, you can't find a spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I actually had conversations with a gospel preacher who says, we need to find out what they're doing so we can do the same thing. And I said, it's real easy. Yeah. It's real easy. If I want to pack the pews, all I got to do is hire an usher to do the song service. <laughs> Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe usher's too recent for some. Yeah. Any of y'all know Sly and the Family Stone? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We in, we, we in 
in Texas. How about for some of you country folk, I get Travis Tritt to come and do a ditty for us in the name of the Lord. If I want to pack the people, all I have to do is entertain them. But that is not what worship is all about. We are the performers. God is the audience. And what happens when God comes to worship and wants a refund? You know what God spent to get you into his body, don't you? He sent his son. His son shed his blood. He loved you enough to die for you. Rose, on the, rose again the third day to show you that death is nothing to be feared as long as you're in his body. And he has a place for you in the, in the great beyond. That's what he spent. What if he wants a refund for the way that we worship God? Secondly, secondly, the hardiness of heart reflects that such men are lovers of their own selves, yeah. covetous, Freaks. posters, Freaks. Proud, blasphemous. They're unthankful mm -hmm. and they're unholy. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy 3 and 2. But you know we shouldn't be concerned or we shouldn't be surprised at any of this because Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 says the thing that hath been Mm. It is that which shall be, mm. and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Mm. When folks want to augment their membership by tweaking God's word, <coughs> by changing God's methodology, yeah. mm. hello, because they're dissatisfied with their doing, doing it God's way, the results that it gives. See, being satisfied with God's word and God's way is nothing new. All right. Eve's dissatisfaction with God's word caused all mankind to lose their home in paradise, mm -hmm. Genesis 3, 6. Cain's dissatisfied with God's, dissatisfaction with God's worship caused him to murder his own brother, Genesis 4 and 8. Israel's dissatisfaction with God's government caused them to get a king which split the kingdom and never were united ever again, 1 Samuel chapter 8, mm -hmm. verses 4 and 5. Church members dissatisfied with God's message causes an abundance of false teachers that are all more than ready to tickle your itching ears. Yeah. Second Timothy chapter 4 and 3. Preachers' dissatisf dissatisfaction with God's gospel will allow them to reintroduce heretical worship practices or styles, costing them their very souls. Second Peter chapter 1 verse yeah. 2. And leaders' dissatisfaction with God's methods Open the doorway to mega church ideology in the Lord's house, yeah. which causes many folk who are sincere to lose their souls behind it. Yeah. Second Peter chapter two, verse number two. Yeah. Beloved, whatever people of God refuse to completely, I said completely, not partially. Hello. Yeah. Oh, I have no problem assembling on the first day of the week. All right. I just don't have to love everybody that's in the audience. Yeah. See, that's partial. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. I, I have no problem calling out a brother when he's wrong. But you better treat me with some respect when I am. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. God wants us to completely follow his word. Because yeah. if we do just a little, hello, and not the entire, it's like going back to the old law doing just a little yeah. and not the entire. If you fail in one point, mm. you're guilty of all. Mm. Whenever God's word and God's way is not completely followed, there's always a tremendous and heavy loss mm. in the lives of many, many people. To hear Eve's loss, Cain's loss, Israel's loss, simply because they were dissatisfied. Number two, the megachurch movement is not only sinister in its origin, it's scandalous in its operation. And Brother, Brother Krause was not telling you anything he's heard. I've already told you all the, all the large places where I have served, and the reason why I left those places is because I had to ask myself, I had to ask myself, am I doing good here despite the evil that's alive. Yeah. I know that I'm held to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. So I'm performing my standard, but I, I seem to be blocked at every turn. Mm. You know, one time after baptizing 12 folks in the baptistry on, on Sunday morning, one of the elders came up to me and said, we're going to have to have these Baptists these 
baptisms to go take place after worship service because they're taking too long. Y'all looking at me like I'm speaking a foreign language. How many of your congregations would be thrilled to have 12 people baptized at once? Amen. Hello? And here I am thinking everybody's going to be excited. No, the leaders. It wasn't the members. It was the leaders that said we're going to have it afterward. I remember one of the deacons came up to me and said, Brother, I need to talk to you. And I'm thinking, okay, what have I done now? I don't, I don't really know this brother. This is a big place. But he knew who I was. Well, it's kind of easy to know who, who I am. Yeah. <laughs> he said, most of the people that you have been baptizing are poor. Don't you know any rich folks? Rich folks have souls too. I did some investigation. He was on the finance committee. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, the standard and the priorities are different when you're in a mega movement because it's no longer a church. It's a business. Yeah. It's a multi-million dollar a year business. And we're not going to do anything to disrupt the cash flow of this cash cow. Amen. Mm. <laughs> How do mega churches get so many members? Verses 6 through 9. Well, see, on the surface, one may think this occurs because of their perceived perks, well, such as, number one, they're able to provide and sustain several personal, familial, community, and community programs mm -hmm. for its members, such as youth, singles, drug addictions, gambling addictions, sex addictions, missions, divorce, divorcees, and the elderly because of an abundance of not only finances, but personnel. Yeah. They can run all of these programs because they have resources for them. Mm -hmm. And they use sometimes these abundant resources for benevolence, for ministries, for building and grounds maintenance, and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. But here's what you don't see. Well, they mm -hmm. show an eager willingness to adapt and cater to the ABCs of millennial mindset, mindset when it comes to membership. Yeah. Uh, have you not heard of the ABCs? Mm -mm. Let me give them Tell to us. You. Number one, they want to be accepted unconditionally without faithfully attending. Yeah. B, they want to belong before they believe. Ooh. C, they want you to confirm them and celebrate them without them ever coming to conversion. Hello? They have no problem bringing in folk from all over as long as they're willing to give. Mm. Mm. Say it. But see, the prominent pitfall of their outreach is that it is purely exclusive. Mm. Uh, it's quiet now. Mm. You know, when I first got to a congregation that was considered a mega church. One of the men that was respected there, Jerry, he came, he said, your, your job is to make this place grow. Well, so here's a book to help you. I'm thinking, I've got enough Bibles. I've got like 20 or 30 Bibles in my possession. He didn't give me that. He gave me Rick Warren's The Purpose yeah. Driven Church. Yeah. Well. Now, let me explain something to you. There are a lot of mega churches that follow exactly what Rick Warren did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what they do. They only pursue the people who are unchurched or have no strong ties to any religious affiliation. Their mindset is if you have a doctrine already, you're disqualified from coming to us. But let me ask this question. If you truly believed your doctrine was the only one hope for man's salvation, why would you disqualify anyone from hearing it? Right. See, sincere people wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. See, regarding the true church, notice what Isaiah, what God says to Isaiah in Isaiah 2.2, 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountain yeah. and all and nations should be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flourish.
flow into it. Did you hear what he said? Yeah. All nations flow into it, not some nations flow into it. Oh, it's getting quiet again. That's all right. I take silence as consent. Paul says as Christians, we must make all men see the truth in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 3 and 9. Yeah. We yeah. share the gospel with everyone regardless of their religious ties. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we share the gospel because of their religious ties. Yeah. If you are not in the church of Christ, and I'm going to say this to all those who don't share our religious convictions, I do not run. If you want to question me afterward, yeah. or if you want to question me as soon as I'm through, I'm willing to go book, chapter, and verse and explain it to you. I am not hostile. Please don't, please don't mistake my intensity for hostility. Hello? Everybody is intense when it comes to that which way, which they love. Hello? You let somebody threaten your child. Hello? Watch that intensity level go up. Now, look, brothers, you let somebody spend a little bit too much time talking to your wife. Watch that intensity level go up. Hello? And when someone starts lying on my Jesus, saying all you have to do is say the sinner's prayer, or come down to the mourner's bench, or carry three days to Jerusalem, I get intense. See, just like Rick Warren in Saddleback Valley, Bill Hybels in Willow Creek, yeah. Carl George in Pasadena, mm -hmm. they all advertise this simple formula. Get those who look and think like us and be selective to whom you choose to bring into the fellowship. In short, when you go fishing, use a hook. Yeah. Mm. But Jesus taught, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered every kind. Yeah. Matthew 13, 47. The only time, beloved, that Jesus instructed a disciple to go fishing with a hook is when he told Peter to take, take the fish, open his mouth, and take out the money yeah. to pay taxes for Peter and for himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the principle to me, that's in Matthew 17, 27. So to me, the principle is simple, Brother Shannon. To gather souls of every kind, use a net. To gather those for money, use a hook. That certainly explains the mega church movement methodology. Yeah, brother. But see, you just can't drop a bare hook in there. You gotta bait the hook. Notice Second Timothy chapter three, verse six. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women. Laden with sins, led away with divers' lust. So, Brother Crosby, how does this work? We'll go back to Genesis 3 and 6. Satan snared Adam by first ensnaring Eve. See, the woman falls when she follows her own lust. And if you read, I don't have time, I've been, I've been given the time card. If you read 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, you see that, that everything she did, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, when she saw that the fruit was good yeah. for food. Mm. <clears throat> and it was one, it was desired to make one wise like God. Mm -hmm. She did take and she did eat. Mm -hmm. See, the woman was deceived. And then the Bible says she gave it to the man which was standing with her. Well, mm -hmm. Hello? Brothers, sometimes standing with your woman is not a sign of love, it's a sign of weakness. All right. Let me say that again. All right. Eve failed because she was deceived. Adam failed because he was weak. When you rather follow the woman than follow the maker, you're weak. Because their wife is dissatisfied. Some, some, some of y'all say, well, you're only talking like that because your wife is here. If my wife was in the audience, she would be putting her head down because she'd be afraid I would be listing some of our personal examples of where that's not true in our house. Hello? My wife isn't here, but my son is, and he'll verify. He talks like this all the time. There she is. There she is. Don't worry, baby. I won't say. I got something, but I won't say. <laughs> My wife knows I've been over backwards for her, but she comes second, and God comes first. Right. 
right. Amen. So you ask why? Why how do they get them? And we know for and I know this because it happened to a congregation where we worship. When the brother split the congregation, he called up all the sisters. He didn't come to us brothers. He called up all the sisters. And when the sisters followed him, guess what their husbands did? Yeah. Reason to know they followed right on <laughs> Amen. Amen. 